Climate change poses an unprecedented challenge demanding urgent action. Today, I will address what Britain should do in response. Britain has no shortage of climate targets. What you can see on the screen behind me is just a selection. However, these targets are detached from reality. They do not grapple with the scale of the transformation or with the pace at which we need to deliver. To illustrate, let me compare what we have delivered over the last decade to what we need to deliver over the next. Let's start with homes. Since 2010, we have increased the number of homes heated by heat pumps by almost 300,000. But in order to meet our targets, by 2035, the same number of years, we need an increase of more than 7.5 million. At the current rate of delivery, we won't achieve this until 2051. Then there's transport. Electric cars were basically uh, non-existent a decade ago. Today, there are more than 800,000 on our roads. This is, this is very impressive. But by 2035, we need about 25 million cars to be electric. The number of people who choose electric over petrol or diesel will need to grow rapidly. To support this, we need an extensive charging infrastructure. But at current pace delivery, we won't have one fit for purpose until 2047. We also need to decarbonize our industry. Since 2010, we've done little to move away from fossil fuels and manufacturing. By 2035, we will have to have found solutions to electrify a large part of it. And then, of course, we need to power all of this. So we need a lot more renewable generation. Over the last decade, we've done a great job of building a, a network of wind and solar farms. But to deliver our targets, we will need to build four times faster. Because at the current pace, we won't deliver clean power until 2062. Over the next decade, we will electrify our energy demand and we will decarbonize our energy supply. But none of this will be possible without the underlying infrastructure. The electricity grid. Unless we have the wires to take clean electricity from where it's generated to where it's used, we cannot reap the benefits of electrification. But achieving a grid fit for the decade ahead of us will require a step change in delivery. Let me illustrate the scale of this challenge. Since 2010, we have built 12 gigawatt of transmission grid across the country. And this map here shows you what the national grid currently has planned to meet the government's offshore wind targets. But this is what we need to deliver to achieve our targets for 2035. By 2035, we need to double the size of the grid. We need to build six times faster than we've delivered since 2012. We need to move six times faster, and at our current rate, we won't have a grid fit for purpose until 2084. And without a grid, net zero doesn't happen. In short, we're about to embark upon a decade of electrification. But delivering this won't be a simple task. It will require nothing short of the largest economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. But this is not just a challenge, it's also a huge opportunity. Without a wholly new approach, a new policy agenda, with a wholly new approach, <laughs> we can make targets into delivery and reap the benefits. So, here's what we do. First, we make Britain an attractive place to invest in clean technology. A total of $318 billion of private capital was spent on the energy transition globally last year, a number that's already increasing rapidly. But last week, the OBR found that investment in low-carbon solutions had fallen in the UK. We can change that. We can bring in pools of capital from around the world through strategic use of public funding as risk-sharing capital by creating strong supply chain agreements and strategies, and by ensuring that our ta tax system incentivizes investment in clean technologies. Second, we use technology to make consumer experiences better and cheaper. 
For instance, by utilizing the power of AI, or through incentivizing integration of more efficient and more consumer-friendly technologies in homes and businesses that also helps them being green. Third, we make the UK a clean energy innovation hub. By increasing R&D investment in core green technologies and by treating data as a competitive asset to drive innovation. And finally, we build more faster. Currently, it takes more than a decade to build a transmission line, much of which is spent in planning. By implementing radical reform to our planning system, we can reduce the time it takes for a project to, to be in planning from an average of six years to less than six months. We also need to build better. Poorly planned infrastructure could cost taxpayers 23 billion this decade. But through the power of technology, we can improve how we plan. A strategic state embraces technology to improve decision making and delivery. Where project previously would be planned by groups of men in suits, uh, ending up uh, spending many hours and often end, ending up with the wrong decisions. New technology, uh, like digital twins, allows us to see the future through data to help us build better the first time. I appreciate that all of this might sound very theoretical. So rather than me just telling you, let me show you. By looking at the most important enabler for the decade of electrification, the transmission grid. Digital twin technology is now so advanced and so sophisticated that we can finally build, in a virtual world, an accurate representation of the physical grid, including its vast complexity and its myriad of dependencies. We can test assumptions, explore options and collaborate on planning and policy design to rapidly identify the most effective, most efficient and most economical solutions. Moving to electric heating will have significant implications for the grid. By using a digital twin, we can ensure that the national grid is optimized and upgraded to support the transition. Without a digital twin, the optimization would have relied solely on judgment, calculated guesswork and quite a lot of luck to get right. Using a digital twin, we can now experiment in a more scientifically rigorous way and fully explore the implications of a number of variables. Phasing out gas boilers and the introduction of heat pumps will happen at different times across the country. We need to model a spectrum of options to understand the demand and supply implications to the grid. We need to consider how different people in different regions of the UK are likely to respond to different financial incentives. Population growth and density are going to place additional and varying demands on the grid and our demand for electricity. Resource availability and proximity to infrastructure will vary too. Through the power of technology, we can manage and even master the complexity of delivering net zero. And equally importantly, we can bring policymakers and the change makers closer together, simulating the impact of various policies and exploring complex financial trade-offs in a data-driven way. We can integrate it into the planning system to allow for better strategic decisions to be made about how, when and where to build infrastructure. It can help us plan and build the electricity grid Britain needs to deliver our net zero targets. But what about the world? Britain and the developed world are historically responsible for the largest share of global emissions. However, today the challenge is first and foremost in the developing world. The most significant emitter is now China. And if we project ahead, this trend only intensifies. And this is before Africa develops. But here's the problem. And the primary reason for that is that the amount of finance being channeled into climate solutions is completely inadequate. Currently, the world's total flow of climate finance is about $850 billion. This needs to be closer to $5 trillion each year. And the finance does exist. It's, being, it's not being spent in the poorest countries, which needs more than $2.4 trillion each year. But the money does exist. 
Global financial wealth held by investors in 2020 stood at over $200 trillion. We need to move away, move all sectors of the economy away from fossil fuels to alternatives such as clean electricity. This involves maintaining steep growth rates for renewables, particularly in developing countries. And we need to find scalable solutions to address emissions from heart of aid sectors like steel and cement. The only way we can achieve this is through the advance of technology. As the example of solar hair shows, with the right incentives in place, we have seen that it is possible to reduce the costs of clean technology alternatives. And the same that happened to solar needs to happen with technologies like hydrogen and carbon capture. We expect two thirds of carbon capture applications we need by 2070 to come from technologies that are still being developed today. Just as it's essential to have a decade of electrification in the UK, we need a decade of technological expansion globally. So let me take you back to this slide. The total of UK emissions is equivalent to addi the additional yearly emissions in China. This is why Britain's role must be threefold. First, to be a tech incubator and launch pad. Second, to facilitate and mobilize climate finance. And third, to provide diplomatic leadership. But the big question is financing the gap between reality and ambition, which we're going to hear more about now. Thank you. <laughs>